everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Lisa. Hi. Welcome to all of you who are new listening to me. Welcome. This is Happy Hour with Dr. Lisa. I'm Dr. Lisa. It's nice to meet all you new people. Thank you for joining. I am your host and we have a really good podcast today. I'm really excited because (laughs) we are going to be talking about the little ghost boy. I posted that on social media yesterday on all my sites and everybody was kind of like, oh my God, we're talking about the little ghost boy finally. Yes. So first I want to remind you to make sure you read the blog. The reason that a lot of you know about the little ghost boy is because you've read the blog. Those of you who have not read the blog yet, he is new to you. Now, mind you, I am all the way on blog 25 today. So this covers blog eight toward the end. So when you have an opportunity, try to read the blog every week and keep up. I post it on Fridays. That website is lisaligginschambers.com. As I always tell you, if you have questions or comments, you want to get on the show live, you can do that. My email address is kids can see ghosts. Can you or kids can see ghosts at gmail.com. You can also call me. I'm on every social media site. I want to remind you that I've had to lock down my social media sites because I mentioned last week that I had some fraud in my account. And so After that happened, I wasn't able to get into my email or anything, so they may have tried to hack my email too. So I locked everything down. I'm going to open Twitter back up pretty soon, but I need to feel comfortable doing that. So if you do want to follow me, just go ahead and send a request on Instagram, Facebook, you know, follow me on Quora um, or Twitter, and I will accept it. All righty. If you want to join the podcast live, make sure you get the Podbean app and you can talk to me live on air. We had one person do that all that already a couple weeks ago. So I'm hoping that you all um, try to do that as well, because I like to interact with you as we talk about these things. If you are watching the show right now live, thank you. It's on Instagram. If you want to put a face to this voice. (laughs) <laughs> it is at kids can see ghosts can you that is instagram so before we get into discussing this little ghost boy i want to share a little story with you that's a bit personal to me um for weeks weeks months probably since january so where are we almost labor day at this point Um, I was talking to a a female that I know in town, and I had been encouraging her, oh gosh, all summer to get her um, COVID vaccination. And I know there are a lot of you who have your own ideas and fears and thoughts about getting a vaccination, but I'm sharing this with you because I want this to be a live example of the potential the potential things that can occur to you right now if you are unvaccinated. I talked to her for weeks, months about getting vaccinated and she would not. And she continued to see clients over and over again since she was able to open back up. Now I'm gonna keep her pretty covered here and not say her, you know, her, where she works or her career, because, you know, I live in a small town and I don't want people knowing about her. Um, anyway, she has been sick now for at least two weeks, very sick. And I'm pretty sad about it. Um, and she is not doing well. She's not doing well. So what happened to me was I stopped seeing her because I have stopped seeing or interacting with individuals who are not vaccinated to protect me, to protect them, and to protect my my children, who, as you know, can't be vaccinated yet. They're too young, my last two babies. So anyway, she's very sick. Um, I don't know if she had to be intubated yet. I'm hoping and praying that she does not have to be. But as of right now, she has been closed up. This is week three. So 
We don't have to go through this. Whatever you feel about the vaccination, if you do get COVID and you are vaccinated, you'll still be able to listen to me tomorrow because you will be okay. Those that aren't vaccinated right now, guys, are passing away, unfortunately, a high percentage. As you all know, we have already started up masking again and all those things, and I'm not going to preach to you, but I will say that here I am. I am talking to you. I could have been exposed by this person, and I am vaccinated. I have been vaccinated since February 1st, Group 1A. And I'm still here, healthy and alive. So please do your homework. Please try to stay away from conspiracy theories. That's all they are, are conspiracies. And if you have questions, you can ask me. And there are a lot of medical professionals that you can ask as well. Okay? So do your homework. Consider getting vaccinated. That's the last thing I'm going to say about it on my podcast. So send a shout out to this woman that I know in prayer for me because I want her to be okay. All righty, let's get to some fun. I know that was heavy. Let's talk about this little, little ghost boy. Let's go back to Child B. So if you don't know who Child B is, Child B starts around blog four or five. So go back to that to figure out who Child B is. If you're new to the podcast, I identify each kid by letter. So we talked about child A. Child A will come up again in later blogs when you get to it. And then child B, we've talked about, we have to continue to talk about child B because as I mentioned to you, child B was a pretty heavy one for me. Taught me a lot of things. So when I started to, one of the things that happened, let me go back, is that there were four buildings at this job, four. Child B was a client of mine from buildings one and building two. When we moved to building two, this is when the fun began. If you didn't think it was fun before, it gets really fun in building two and it gets a little creepy. Okay. Building two is where a lot of paranormal activity occurred. And it starts with this little ghost boy. So one day I went to go get um, child B and family from the waiting room. And child B was terrified. I didn't know why. Child B used to always run up the steps to the office. Um, and I would just kind of look like, okay, well, child B's being a kid, running up the steps. Child B used to not go to the bathroom without mom or me or me, me or mom standing outside of the bathroom door. Child B would not go into the waiting room on the second floor. This was a beautiful building. So each floor had a waiting room. So this was a three flat in the past. And so there was a kitchen on every floor, including the first floor. So the first floor, second floor, and third floor all had kitchens, all had living rooms, which they turned into waiting rooms. And so the waiting room on my floor, and I think in previous blogs, I said that I was on the third floor. That's not true. I was on the second, I believe I was on the, no, my boss was on the second floor. That's right. I was on the third floor. So our waiting room, I already described to you in the blog. So you know about that. It was very beautiful, full of toys. You would think that a kid would want to go into this um, waiting room, but not child B and not a couple of other kids. So every time, imagine me going downstairs, greeting my clients, this is a child who would run up the steps, or this is a child who would cling to mom or cling to me, which was different because this was not a, a little one. I think child B was mid-age, maybe 10 or 11. And so to cling to mom, you know, to come upstairs was a little bit unusual. And so one day when we went up to my office, this child sat on the floor and mom was in my office. And I said, 
we had a conversation about this new behavior. Because mind you, this wasn't a behavior that happened in building one. And also building one didn't have a staircase. Uh, our offices were just on the first floor. So when we were in that room, I remember that day, it was really bright outside. And I had to get to the bottom of, you know, what was happening um, on that first floor. And child B shared with me that there's a little ghost on the first floor. And I'm like, crap, you know, what is this thing that, you know, this kid is seeing? I need to know. Oh, man, you know, here we go. <laughs> All kinds of things were going through my head. And so... Um, Sometimes the best people to explain things to you are the parents because they can talk to you in an adult manner, obviously, to make you understand what's happening. This is a mom I already told you who could see ghosts too. So mom shared with me more detail. And, and here's the thing. I want you to remember this little ghost boy because this is really important. And I hinted publicly that this little ghost boy actually turned into a movie probably when I was a little girl. So that's a hint for you. Again, we're going to talk about that around Halloween. So this entity was in the shape of a little boy. Um, and what this little boy would do would be to run down the hallway when the kids were in the building. And so there was a massive amount of anxiety that some of my kids would experience. And I'm kind of lost, like, you know, what, why are my kids having so much anxiety? Well, the mom explained it to me. There's a ghost of a boy in the building and gave me the background about the little boy. Child B told me that when I come downstairs, the little boy is following me. Or when I get downstairs, the little boy is running down the hallway in a long hallway and the little boy is like running down the hall. Or if I'm standing greeting the, um, the clients or her family, the little boy is standing next to me. So I can't see ghosts. So I don't know all this is happening. So what's, what the mom thought was happening was that this little boy was trying to get my attention and wasn't intentionally scaring child B. Child B was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I don't know what this, I, I see it, but it's just like running real fast. Cause if you can imagine a, a little boy running, that's what they described him doing in the building. And so, uh, it terrified this child. Later on, you'll find out why. Anyway, we're sitting in the office and child B is very comfortable in my office. And, you know, that was um, kind of, it was almost weird to me because here you have a kid developing anxiety, you know, just in the waiting room running up the steps, then we get to my office and bam, it shuts off. All the anxiety, you know, the tension, the fear, the need to get away quickly, it all shut off and it shut off pretty quickly. So to any of you who are, you know, therapists, you would kind of go, huh, what just happened here? You know, I thought we were going to work down on the symptoms of anxiety. I thought we were going to uh, work through the you know, some of the, the tension and we're going to do some nice relaxation to get ready for therapy and it all shut off. And so I started to ask questions to find out why that happened. Why all of the <laughs> behavior shut off? Somebody said therapy with Dr. Lisa must really work. That's because Dr. Lisa didn't see any ghosts to get scared herself. <laughs> or have her own tension. And so what happened was the uh, child B said, your office is safe. And I thought, well, what does that mean? What do you mean the office is safe? It's, it's not scary. Um, 
I am going to describe my former office to you. I described it before. I'm going to describe it again. So there were two big windows. My, uh, my desk was facing the back. So that meant that the windows were going to be on my left. There were two closets in the back and the carpet was blue. It was really big, nice, big office. Like a, it used to be a bedroom years ago. And I had stuffed animals and a bookshelf because I have a lot of therapy materials and also um, books, you know, DSM-5 and all that stuff. And so the child B would always sit on my bean bags or on the floor and I used to sit with her. And then the mom, of course, would sit like in the chairs and everything. And if you can imagine me sitting in the chair, I had the baby by this time. So I was not pregnant anymore. So I'm in the chair and this kid is like in the bean bag and explaining to me why the office felt safe and that the little ghost boy could not come into my office. And so what was shared with me was that my office was, the air was clean, it was bright. These, the, the little ghost boy and other entities in the building were not coming into my office. And I imagine if you're the therapist or you're the psychologist, you would kind of be blown away or looking at your clients like, what in the world is happening here? <laughs> But I told you guys, I've had so much experience with the paranormal with kids that I always um, kept a Bible in my office. That's something that I learned to do. I also prayed over my office. I prayed over, you know, things that the kids, how they would interact with different things. And so, you know, within the building. And so when they talked about it being clean or, or, or uh, safe to quote child B, that's a quote, it meant that this little boy and this little spirit boy and other um, entities that were seen in the building were not coming into the office. So we talked about this little ghost boy for a very, very long time that day um, and kind of used that as therapy because um, it was important because we needed to make sure that the, um, the feelings of anxiety and tension had decreased. So we really could not, I mean, continue to decrease, not just in the moment, but that was something that we made sure we worked on. And mom stayed in this session because I really wanted to understand from an adult perspective what was happening. And I couldn't do that from child B. Child B would talk to me like this. It's a little ghost boy. It's a boy. And I'm like, I don't see a boy. What is it? <laughs> she, she, girl, child, child B is a girl. Well, it's a little spirit boy who used to live in the home. Uh-oh, really? <laughs> yes, used to live in a home. And I said, oh, uh, really? Okay, okay, you guys wanna know? <laughs> I'll tell you before October, because it's so good. But you gotta say something to me if you really wanna know more about this little boy, or I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna make you wait until October. So you need to send me a message or something now and say, Talk about the little boy, or I'm going to hold it till October. But according to this family, and along with other families, this little boy lived in the home and didn't leave. Wow, right? So, <laughs> so you know, I, I don't know. I was kind of blown away. So I'm going to pause right there and see if you want to hear about this little ghost boy and his background. While I wait to see if you respond, 
I am going to <laughs> tell you more about, I'm laughing because some people on Instagram are like, will you talk about the little boy? But before I, I go that route, if you want to hear about this little boy, um, let me say this. There were other instances of, <laughs> there were other instances of, um, you know, different paranormal activity that I actually experienced myself in building too. Well, okay. There have been enough people to say, we can talk about the ghost boy. So let's talk about it. So this is what I learned. <laughs> Keeping you in suspense on purpose. There were, I want to give you a visual. I always like to give you a visual. When you walked up the steps to the second floor, to the right, there were two offices. So if you can see me, there was an office that was going to be to your immediate right. And there was one to your left. Mine was to the left. If you're standing in front of the offices, mine was to the left. So these were the two, what I said, formal bedrooms, former bedrooms. In the hallway, um, if I recall correctly, there was a closet. Because remember, this was a home at one point. And then there was a family room. And, um, and then there was a, um, you know, a long hallway, bathroom, long hallway, and, and, you know, the kitchen was up here and, you know, in the back there's, um, you know, another area. And so, um, this little boy used to live in the building according to child B and child B's mother. So this is what they said to me. They said, do you know the Catholic priests live in, the, in building four? And I said, yes, I found out about those Catholic priests um, from another child. Told me that there are Catholic priests on the, uh, you know, in building four. And so I said, what about them? And they said, uh, well, those were the Catholic priests who did the exorcism for this little ghost boy. And I'm like, huh? And they said, remember the movie, The Exorcist? And I was like, yeah. And they said, well, that's the little boy. And I said, no, it was a girl. And they said, no, you need to check your history. The movie was based upon a girl. The boy, it was a boy who was possessed. And the Catholic priests in Building 4 were the priests who conducted his exorcism. Let that marinate for a minute. Do you understand? Yep, way. So our buildings were 1, 2, and 3. I was in Building... Oh! If I do building two like that, that'll give you the finger. I'm sorry. So building two. <laughs> I cracked myself up. I'm sorry. I gave everybody watching me the middle finger by mistake. So that was building two. Building three was our administrative offices. Building four is where the Catholic priests live. And I said, wait a minute. The movie The Exorcist? And they said, yeah. And I said, wait, so they cut me off and they said, this is really going to blow you guys away. They said, the psychologist's office. So they said, the little ghost boy used to live here, right? The psychiatrist's office was the office to the right. Remember I talked about the two offices? The psychologist that treated the little boy was in your office. <laughs> and I said, whose office? <laughs> they said, your office. The psychologist's office was your office. This whole building was... Lit was where people lived. 
So what you don't understand is that the little boy from the exorcist was actually from St. Louis and lived right here and lived right in this building and was treated here. And the Catholic priests are the ones who did it next door in building four. And I was blown away. So my office was a psychologist's office that they saw that treated. Because remember, if you remember the movie, there just just based upon the movie, there was some, you know, treatment. Obviously, you know, it's kind of what I go through with different kids. You know, they come to me or they came to me back then and needed, you know, therapy or they needed psychological testing, right? So it's the same thing. So, you know, by now, you know me, I like research and I'm going to research these things to find out the truth. So the first thing I did is that I called the administrator's office in the building and confirmed that the Catholic priest lived next door, which we already talked about. And that, yes, they were involved in that exorcism and they will not talk about it to this day. And we went outside and child B said, there's a crucifix on every door. And the mom said, do you know why Dr. Lisa? And I'm just standing there like, I know you're gonna tell me. And they said, Catholic priests put those on the doors after this happened. So I don't know the validity of that part, but I will tell you that there is a crucifix on every single door in buildings one, two, three. And I'm gonna assume four, but I'm not sure about four because again, that was a private residence, but definitely buildings one, two, and three. So I asked the staff, why is there now, hey, I'm all for the crucifix being on the door. I'm not even Catholic, you know, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they said, yeah, yeah, those, been on, those have been on the door for years since all of that happened. So I'm like, you guys know about this stuff? And the person that I talked to said, oh, yeah. And remember, they told me the, the demon that child A saw in building three, they knew about it. Remember that? They said, yeah, we know about it, right? Mm -hmm. So they also knew about this. They also knew about this and confirmed this, right? So I said, oh my God, you guys know like the exorcist, like really? And they're like, oh yeah. Like I'm the one blown away, right? You know, not a St. Louis native, lived there twice, um, working there. And I'm kind of, you know, like I didn't even know that the kid in the movie was wrong. I always thought it was a girl, right? It's a boy, guys. So... This is why child B was afraid of the little ghost boy because they knew all this. And remember I said, this family was a bit different than some of them because remember I said, this is a mom who could see everything. She even saw things about my kids, my kids, all three of them. I have three kids. So this mom saw, you know, things about my kids too. And so this is a mom who could see what was happening. For example, I'm, I'm telling you this, how far this mom can go. Things that have happened to my pastor. She, she never met my pastor. And I confirm with my pastor, these things are true. And he said, yes. So I just didn't take their word for granted. Okay. I'm too smart for that. I don't know everything, but I'm too smart for that one. So what I did was I started researching some of this stuff. Now, mind you, I already researched um, the land and the some of the other stuff with, you know, building three. This time I went back and I researched, you know, the child that was in The Exorcist, the movie. Then I researched, um, where that child was from, which the mom didn't 
talk to me about this, but I don't know how much you guys know, but that child was actually from the East Coast and moved to St. Louis. So I sat there probably, I kid you not, about a week just kind of going through um, various details about what this family told me. So, yeah. So now I want to share with you, after I found out that information, before we talk about child B some more um, and more details about that experience, because if you have questions, just shoot them to me. I'll answer them. Um, a couple of things started happening to me after I found out about this. Um, yeah, a couple of things, but I'll tackle one with you right now. So one day I was in the building by myself. Building, where was I? Building two by myself. So sometimes when you work in these mental health centers, you actually have to close because everybody will leave. And this is one of those days where I had to lock down the building. Now I want you to imagine how you would feel after you found out some of that information. You also confirmed that the things that child A said were true. Um, imagine how you would feel being in that building by yourself. I was like, oh crap. But let me tell you this before I talk about some things that happened to me while I'm thinking about it. I actually went back and talked to my boss about what was said to me. And I already told you, I went back and started calling, you know, some other people that work there in administration. And I was probably pretty freaked out at that point. One of the movies that I can never watch was The Exorcist. I can't watch it to this day. I don't even get scared of like the paranormal, but something about The Exorcist, I can't do. do. What's that other movie? Chain, Chain Lee, something like that. I can't watch that one either. It's too real to me after going through, you know, all of this stuff with the kids. And so once I found out all of this stuff, I went to my boss and she just, I, t I talked about this in the blog. She just grabbed my hand and we just prayed because she said she knew. And she knew about what was in building three, which was one of the reasons that she moved her office. She knew that there was a, um, a ghost in building three. And that's why she moved because she said she didn't want to deal with that and she couldn't take it. But lo and behold, a lot of the kids start talking about, you know, the little ghost boy to me. And there were was some paranormal activity that I was experiencing. And so she just that day, she just grabbed my hand, you know, after this kid left. And we just prayed in every single room. Pray, pray, pray. Because I said, this is getting nerve wracking. I'm human. You know, all these kids are telling me all these different stories about the little ghost boy and the demon in building three and the land being haunted. And there's angels all around me. God bless me because I want the angels to be around me. God's angels, that is, especially, you know, in dealing with this, you know, these different this paranormal activity and all of these different uh, this presence. So that may have happened between us, I don't know, shortly after uh, child B and, you know, her mom had talked to me about these things, because I'll tell you, there were some paranormal things that happened to me after she told me. So one of the one of the most vivid experiences that I had was that day I had to close up the building. I don't know why I didn't shit bricks. I didn't, <laughs> but I should have. I'm thinking about it now. Like I should really be shitting bricks because this was scary. So, you know, I'm turning off the lights. Yes, I'm turning off the lights in this building. And I'm like, you know, not really scared until this happened. <laughs> I get up to... Um, the remember I said there's even though there's a waiting room on the first floor, each floor had a family room, which we consider, you know, a waiting room or a conference room. And you when you turn off the lights, you turn them off in there, too. And I walked in there to turn off the lights and I am in the doorway. 
I didn't even walk into the building yet. I'm in the doorway and the toys went off. Now, to all you parents, it is typical to step on a Lego. <laughs> it is typical to hear a toy going off. To this day, if I hear a toy going off, I look at it for a minute, just like this, to see how many are going to go off just because of this experience. I don't know. And so all the toys went off. Every last one of them. And I'm standing in the doorway like, Wow, loud, fire trucks, police cars. Um, I can still see it in my head. There were two shelves. There was, there was a, like a, a, a bookshelf where we kept the toys over here to the right. And there was one right by the door. And I'm standing in the door and they just all go off. Okay, so like I said, I should have been scared, but I wasn't. I'm just looking at and my mouth is just wide open. And I'm like, where I got this from, I don't know. But I, I said, cut it out. Just stop. You're scaring the kids. Cut it out. And what do you think happened? Yep. The toys stopped. And I stood there like, I cannot believe this just happened. I got to resign. I got to leave. I can't deal with this. All these kids have anxiety when they come in here. I'm getting anxious. I'm sitting here telling toys to cut it out or entities. I can't see this stuff. You know, obviously I'm feeling stressed out at that point. I'm like, I, I told my husband when I got home, I said, all these toys just, you know, went off. And then I said, okay, stop. You're scaring the kids. Cut it out. You're scaring the kids. Oh, one more thing. I also went, those toys that make noise, I went and turned them off permanently. I was like, these shits are off. I am not um, dealing with this crap again. I turned those, I went through and turned before I left, I turned those toys off. And I don't know if that was my own anxiety because it was just getting to be too much or what, but I went and I turned those toys off um, and didn't have that experience again. But that's when I started to think, okay, maybe I need to resign. My kids aren't going to get better. You know, if they keep feeling anxious in this building, you know, in my mind, I was not sure what to do for myself. My goal is to make kids feel better, not to cause them more tension. So I was pretty confused at that point as to what I want to do, wanted to do at the time. Um, but I'll tell you this, what happened to me when I left that building, turned all those toys off, went outside, locked up, went outside. And I looked, so this, this is in a city. This was in the city of St. Louis. So there was an alley in the back. So I want you to picture the buildings, the sidewalk before you get to the parking lot, the parking lot, and then um, you go out and there's an alley. <sighs> there's a big dumpster in the alley. I will never, ever forget this Ever. There's a man in the dumpster, African-American homeless. At least he looked homeless to me. And I'm looking at him and I'm in my car and I'm watching him. And I have a lot of compassion for people. So I remember just sitting there thinking, I mean, there's just nothing I can do at that point. So I drove down the alley and I went to Whole Foods close to where I live in St. Louis. And when I was in Whole Foods, this is all this all happened the same day. I went to Whole Foods and you guys aren't even gonna believe me if I tell you. <laughs> Cause when I thought about it and I've talked about it to different people for a very long time because it completely blew me away. 
You know how when you were little, you would say, God is my witness. God as my witness, guys. All this stuff is very true, true stories. You know how your mom used to say, you'll never know when you encounter an angel? Believe it. Believe it. There was a homeless man in front of me at Whole Foods. And I said to myself, this couldn't be the same man. I left the city and I lived about 20 minutes from the city. I was like, no, that's not him. But then, ignoring my own instincts, the man left the store and I said, shoot, I should have paid for his stuff. I should have paid for his stuff. He didn't have enough money. Lisa, why didn't you pay for his stuff? Because I have done that, right? I have done that. So I said, that was my opportunity to help somebody. And I said, I swear he had on the same coat as that man in the alley. So I left Whole Foods and went to Target. And you know who was there? That man. Yep. This time I caught him. This time I caught him. And I said, you know what? I am so sorry. I said, I should have paid for your drink. I, I didn't mean to do that. I was standing right behind you watching you. But guys, remember too, I was also trying to process, was this the same person? And I said, do you still want it? And what else do you need? I can get you some groceries, whatever you need. And he, go, he turns around. It has the, this really big smile. And he goes, no, I was pregnant. He said, no, actually I was, you know what? I said I wasn't pregnant. Yes, I was, I was pregnant. This was right before I had my son. Yes, this was, all of this was right before I had my son because I'll tell you why I'm gonna correct this because I was getting, wrong, getting ready to go on maternity leave and started thinking about staying home with my new baby, my son. And because I had so much anxiety, that's when I was thinking about I was going to resign. I'm going to correct that from earlier. I was pregnant. All of this happened on the same day. You know what the man in the brown coat said to me? He turned around with the biggest smile and he said, no. He said, you have something to the, to the effect of you have, you take care of that boy, that baby boy. You save your money and give it to that little boy. How did he know I was having a boy? And he was just smiling at me. And I said, no, I can take care of the baby. This was a stranger, mind you. I said, I can take care of the baby, but I want to buy this for you. Let's get some groceries. And he smiled and he said, no, you got to take care of that baby. And I never saw that man again. So I talked to my mom about it. My mom is watching. And I wonder if she remembers that because I asked my mom, you know, have you ever encountered an angel? And she said, yes. When my mother died, my grandmother, maternal grandmother, I encountered an angel. And I said, really? And she told me the story. And I said, mom, I don't know how to confirm this, but I swear to God that was an angel. I think that was the same man that I saw Um when I was at work in the trash can. I said, then I saw him at Whole Foods. Then I saw him again at Target. And I said, that's no coincidence. It's not every day that you walk into Whole Foods or Target and see someone homeless. And then my mom told me, she said, I bet you encountered an angel. And, you know, guys, I wonder if that Angel was there. Remember, child B talked about how I always cleansed the offices and prayed and blah, blah, blah. I actually, they were the ones that told me to start praying on my job, my, my way home, to protect myself and my family from what I, what I was experiencing, you know, in buildings one, two, and three. And so my thought was maybe this was one of them protecting me after what happened in the building that day. So, you know, I know this was a lot, right? 
But all of this happened and eventually there's more to talk about, but I want you to know because I felt at that time, well, for one, I wanted to, you know, stay home with my son. But the other thing was I felt as if my kids just, to me, they just weren't getting better. You know, they were very, there were other kids. I mean, I talked right now, we're on kid um, G, I believe I left off. Um, so you guys are on, if you don't read the blog, you're on child B, I'm all the way to child G. So there were a lot of situations that happened with these kids, you know, and the majority, the majority of the kids did see the little ghost boy and it was causing so much tension, so much anxiety. And it was it felt to me, you know, like, how could I help them get better if they're already walking into an agency and they are scared? They are scared. So ultimately, I made the decision to um, to resign and then had the baby and then, you know, went on and worked somewhere else. But a lot of my stories come from these buildings and a lot that I learned from the kids that I work with, you know, in these buildings. So <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things that, um, that occurred there and occurred with uh, child B. This is a, it, it is interesting because now you probably understand why I started to take these things seriously. These were different kids. They had some of the same um, experiences. When I work with them, they are confidential. So they didn't know one another. It kept happening, right? And they would have the same stories about different things that they're experiencing. Another coincidence, were experiencing. Another coincidence is that these kids had some of the same mental health concerns but they were just different kids, which is what led me to think, you know, is there a connection between the paranormal and mental health, right? So this was a pivotal time for me, even though I ended up, I wound up leaving, but it was a time when I started to put the connection between, is this really schizophrenia or is this mental illness? Or is this a behavior concern? Or is the, I'm not, I'm sorry, schizophrenia or the paranormal? Or is this a behavior concern? Or is this a kid who can see ghosts? It was just a lot of learning, I think, in that two years that I worked there. There are other stories, and I haven't even told you all, all of the details about the little ghost boy and a connection with the Catholic priest and the exorcist. And I will tell you that over time. But it was a, a point in my career when I actually felt the need to go on behalf of kids. And I actually loved it there. And oh, love my boss. She is phenomenal. I talked to her not too long ago. And I still love that woman. So it was a really hard decision, a very hard decision but I felt like it was the best thing to do. And besides that, you know, kind of think for a minute how I felt too, um, as a psychologist, when you wanna, you work with kids because you really wanna help them, but I just, at the time, I just felt like, to, you know, I, I, I'm almost powerless to help them. So I was a lot younger too. I may have been, you know, in my mid, I may have been, you know, 39, 38. So I was a lot younger than what I am now. And the there were there were a lot of learning experiences for me during that time. So one of the big, big things that I learned is that other than understanding how to treat these kids when they're experiencing those things, one of the big things I learned is that I could do it and how to do it and then how not to be afraid, but also that I had a responsibility to tell other people like all of you about what's happening to these kids. And that's the purpose of the podcast. Now, 
on one last thing before I let you guys go. There are a lot of people now feeling encouraged to talk about, you know, their experiences. Um, there have been quite a few people reach out to me on Facebook sharing their stories, deep stories. Some of them I have to read two and three times because I just can't, you know, understand them initially. And there are um, a couple of, you know, young adults, 18 and 19 recently, who started um, talking to me about them being nebulous children. And so that's the purpose, you know, for you guys to start, you know, opening up and sharing your experiences and, you know, feeling more comfortable. It took me way too long, over 20 years, to start talking about these things, but I want you to know it's a safe place to do that. So if you do want to talk about it, you know, you can come on air. Um, there was a gentleman who did that a couple of weeks ago and it was phenomenal. So the latest question that I had from someone pretty young, young enough to be my kid, so pretty young, was a uh, young man who, you know, I can't answer every question, but these kind of questions come up where they see different, what they call orbs in the air, different lights, balls of lights. You know, what What do I do about these, you know, bul bulbs of lights or balls of lights? Some of you have heard of them called orbs. So supposedly orbs are what is seen before, you know, someone sees a ghost. Now, I have never experienced that. I told you guys I can't see. And I have not had any kids, you know, who saw different orbs, orbs, but there are quite a few people in particular telling me stories about, you know, when they were younger, what they used to see. So I don't, you know, deny that those things happen. I just don't know how to answer that in a way that, that, that treats the paranormal part. But I'll tell you what I do know is that you don't, if you don't want to be bothered, you just demand these things to go away in God's name, you have the power to do that. So this person doesn't want to be bothered with that. So that's what you do. So that was the most important lesson to me and for me during those two years where I worked, two, three years where I worked, when I worked with Child B. And we will talk about how Child B began to share with me the different um, ways or confirm with me that these things worked. I never got that far with child A. And you already know why. But child B would confirm for me as well as her family that these things actually worked. So it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. It works. And I hope that you, know, you trust what I'm telling you. So if you are listening, you're that 18 year old who wrote in about that to me. That's what you do if you would like to get rid of what you see. Okay? So you all have a good night. Thank you for listening. And I will see you next week. Again, if you have any questions, make sure you contact me. I'm easy to find. All right? Bye-bye.